Hi, Byron. This is Sol. This is Solvi, and Byron and I are going to talk about visual literacy. Byron, do you have a good definition for visual literacy? Uh, hi. Um, yeah, I think visual literacy to me is understanding and absorbing all the elements of something that's communicated to us. Uh, you take in the words combined with the pictures, the color, the layout, throwing that all together and putting a message into your head and getting a message into your head from what you see visually and reading. That's what visual literacy to me is, uh, basically is. Um, you know what? I, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, no, that's okay. I like the word understanding that you put in there because one of the words that I had pulled out of the reading was competency. One of the writers mm. referred to vision competencies and, um, I, for some reason, the idea of understanding sounds a lot more appealing to me than being competent. <laughs> um, yeah, and, it's a little bit more soothing, I guess. And, and competency is a little more like if you measure up, and understanding is, uh, it seems kind of truer to me, actually, that... It does. It seems more spiritual, almost, too. And I guess that's kind of like an example of, like, you know, I guess we're, you know, verbally talking now, but you're, you know, you're understanding me and... You know, at the same time, you know, absorbing in what I have to say on a different level, and it's more personal or whatever. Uh, I think that could be applied definitely to visual literacy the same way. Uh, you could be visual, you know, not understand things uh, sometimes when things are presented visually. Maybe that's like an artistic eye that you have to have or whatever, but uh, sometimes if you mix the wrong message with the wrong picture, uh, you could get a total different uh, interpretation of that message, which could cause a lot of confusion. So it's very important yeah, to be visual literate and to understand and to be to make sure that the person receiving the message understands what you're visually trying to say. Um, you're, I know you have a graphic design background. Do you have any good examples of um, misunderstanding or visual literacy incompetency? Well, as a designer, I kind of want to definitely bring in, like, the, the client or bring in the reader, actually. The, you know, I'm trying to sell a product. Uh, if I'm designing an ad uh, for a magazine or something, and, or if I'm laying out a page for a newspaper, uh, I want to make it appealing to the eye. So a lot of times there's certain way a story would flow in a page layout and a certain spot will be left for an advertising or an, or an ad. Uh, that's done purposely. That's just not because that's just thrown there and wung in, you know, like at the last minute. It's uh, purposely placed in that position because some people feel that, you know, people are going to be drawn to that spot. And they're going to see that person's advertisement on that page. And most of the times it's on the outside of the page, not inside of the page. And the story is inside. Because people will tell you in the publishing world that the ads sell the newspaper more than the story itself. Uh, uh, which is true because people are paying the advertising, you know, which basically pays for your paper. Uh, but that's a whole other tangent right there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I think that uh, being a graphic designer, I have to incorporate that visual message and make sure that things are appealing to the eye and that the, the person that's going to view whatever I'm creating understands that. Yeah. Remember that old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words? Yes. It's yes, referred to in one of our readings. <laughs> and... Um, isn't that interesting now that technology makes it so easy for us to share pictures with each other and where we used to have to sit down and spend hours writing a postcard. Now you can in oh, yes. seconds share the same kind of information. Yeah, it's definitely more, uh, you know, true today that visually, uh, you know, a picture could say a thousand words. I mean, uh, it definitely helps. <laughs> How do you think that's going to change um, education in the classroom setting? Do you think we're going to be using uh, pictures more to communicate information I with think, students? Uh, definitely.
probably, I think you're definitely going to see those pictures, but probably translated differently. Like, you're probably going to see them more digitally. I don't think you're going to see, like, the old-fashioned... Uh, <laughs> the overhead projector? That's, you know, got pictures and stuff like that. But it definitely makes, uh, you know, the lesson move more smooth. And it definitely, uh, I think, makes teaching those students understand because they have a visual uh, help added into the lesson so they could experience everything and see it visually like playing out Um, yes do you think students would learn less because they're not reading but looking at pictures instead or do you Um, think do you think they could be learning more I think that uh, they shouldn't fall into the habit where they're just relying on pictures. They should definitely combine the two, and they should uh, have the two work together and to teach them the true meaning and not just simply, you know, looking at pictures and, oh, that's cool, that's nice, I got it. And, uh, you know, because that's a lot of times not the case. So you got to kind of like work the two together and not just like uh, say like, oh, pictures are enough, that's all. I mean, pictures are worth a thousand words, but they're not all the words, maybe I should say. Yeah, yeah. And I, it is good to know that uh, teachers are still going to be needed to help students to understand the pictures and how the pictures yeah. relate to each other. Or video clips. Yeah. <laughs> video clips are even better because uh, they uh, they take it a step further by incorporating sound and communi- another you know form of communication. Uh, that we take for granted, and, uh, you know, that just throws in the whole visual and sound, making it even easier, I think, to understand a message. So I think the more elements that you throw into a lesson could help a student, as long as they, uh, they're they able to get the right message from it. And I think it's, as an educator, we have to make sure that we, we're doing that. Like, we're making sure that we're not just throwing in a whole bunch of garble, and, you know, and let the student decide what to think of it. Uh, we have to have, like, a set, like, lesson. This is what I'm, you know, incorporating into the lesson. I'm going to use this picture because this picture definitely spells out what I'm trying to relate. Yeah, the two definitely have to work together. So when you mentioned the word garble, I started thinking about um, a quote from the reading, from the Duncombe reading, uh, from, and I think he was referring to something that Brent Wilson had said, that he um, conceived of art education as no longer being tree-like um, with a core of stu- skills and knowledge taught by teachers, but as rhizomatic with uh, yeah. a lot of entry and exit points. What do you think about that? Well, I definitely am familiar with the quote, and um, I think he's right. I think that the, the way that you know art education is taught these days, it's not... Uh, you know, like a tree. It's not like straight up and down. There's many branches and they're all growing from different angles. And that could be a good thing. It could look chaotic, though. So maybe, you know, it's good and bad. But I think that it's more good because you're opening up more more ways of just educating people. Yeah, and we talked a lot last week about authentic learning versus didactic learning. And... Um, <laughs> That rhizomatic conception of of teaching, um, it does allow for the student to reach out in whatever direction they want, rather than, you know, being told you have to aim for the sun and that's the only way you're going to survive. Yeah. You know, they can really kind of explore yeah, you, you their own things. You didn't mention my favorite word that we uh, discussed last lesson: pedagogy. Pedagogy. <laughs> I left it out <laughs> because it's not really my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> I just like uh, I just love saying that word. It reminds me of like a an animated character or something. I, but, uh, it yeah, makes I, I definitely. Uh, it makes me it feel well, like I'm in grad school. I don't really like it. It's too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the word rhizomatic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when you're thinking about education as being rhizomatic and reaching out in whatever direction at once. Um, do you think it waters it down? Do you think it takes away, like... I don't think it waters it down. It may, like, use up resources, and, uh, you know, schools may give up on it if uh, they find that, uh, oh, you know, this is just draining the pool and uh, not really producing. 
So you just really got to like make sure the tree uh, and the branches grow a healthy way. And, uh, you know, you got to be like the gardener that takes care of them and uh, show them and provide to them the, I guess, the food that they need for their, uh, you know, growing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry, but that sounded too, uh, <laughs> too corny <laughs> we're, or whatever. We're, ta- <laughs> we're talking too much about it's true. Too much yeah, about it's trees. True. You, got, you got to be like the, the, the gardener treating that tree, and, like, you got to, like, make sure you take care of that tree. And, you, you know, if you want your branches to flourish, that's great. But, you know, provide to them the right, you know, sources and materials and expose them to all the the latest digital and technologies that are out there. Yeah. So the um, the pedagogy that was actually referenced in this week's reading was something that Duncombe called a playful dialogic pedagogy. Um, mm. And uh, I love that because I think I mentioned in one of the other lessons that I think uh, humor is really important um, in oh, the learning yeah, process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, I agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if it was even this class that I learned or read that the uh, humor definitely uh, reflects in being more creative. It's just like the, if you could imply that into your lesson, you're actually being more creative in a way. Um, at least that's what I, I read somewhere along the line as well. But, uh, yeah, I think humor would definitely... Uh, lighten the mood and make more people uh, inviting to learn and uh, uh, it certainly would make math more appealing <laughs> <laughs> uh, humor makes everything better um, yes <laughs> but the the idea of a, a playful do- dialogue being a learning tool is pretty appealing um, yeah. I, guess, I guess in the classroom totally. that, that could include um, visual means also right Oh, yeah. I mean, you could definitely imply, uh, you know, visual uh, means to uh, almost anything. I mean, uh, not just humor, even, you know, I mean, you could, uh, uh, you know, another thing that I heard, another myth or whatever, that uh, a lot of creative people are uh, hard to deal with, or they're miserable people, but, uh, you know, no one can really explain that myth, but, (laughs) so... I think you just got to look at everything and take in everything and kind of uh, just like think on a visual level and make sure that you understand what the message really is. But uh, I think we did uh, definitely uh, get enough on this first podcast. I was just thinking the same but, thing. <laughs> yeah. And I look forward to the next podcast. I'm looking forward uh, to it too. I guess this is Byron and Sobe signing off for our first podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.